What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of the show in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a look at another mafia topic. And most of the stories we talk about on the channel have a lot to do with New York, Chicago, and other areas. We occasionally will do a show on Philadelphia, and we're going to do that today. If you know anything about me, I uh, know these areas well. I lived in South Philly for many years, and uh, the story that we're going to talk about today is a very detailed one, but I feel it's one we definitely need to talk about. Uh, if you know anything about the Philly mob, you've likely heard of people like Angelo Bruno, Long John Martirano, and John Stanfa. But what about the individual we're going to talk about today? You could ask people around South Philly, and they're going to say a couple of things about today's subject, John Vesey. Is he a miscreant? Is he a rat? Probably. You'll hear that for sure. But you also hear the stories about how feared John Vesey was at one point in South Philadelphia. According to one individual that I talked to, there was no one at a time in Philadelphia in the early 90s that could fuck with John Vesey. It was that simple. Today, we're going to talk about his rise into the Philadelphia Mafia under lunatic John Stanfa and really talk about his downfall and ascent uh, into prison and the Witness Protection Program. The story of John Vesey next, like nowhere else on Sit Down Shorts. John Vesey was born in 1967, and he would talk pretty openly about his life. It was not an easy one. Uh, John grew up with uh, five brothers and sisters, and actually his mother uh, would actually take in two children that belonged to one of her family members who passed away. Uh, so there were a lot of mouths to feed, and there was no father to speak of. John Vesey would talk uh, in his uh, adult life that he really didn't know much about his father. The one thing that he did know was when the day he was born, when he came home from the hospital, his father would accuse his mother of cheating with a member of her doctor team that birthed her son, and he would attempt to light their home on fire. From that day on, he uh, was told by his mother that she never saw her husband, Walter, again. And it was unclear uh, what exact nationality Walter Vesey was. Now, by all accounts, uh, his mother uh, was Italian, Sophia, but uh, his father, as he would say, he didn't know whether he was Irish uh, Spanish, Native American, or Italian. There was questions that he may have been all of those different things. But one thing we can venture to believe, John Vesey was not full Italian. However, if you know anything about the neighborhoods that John Vesey frequented in South Philadelphia, they're all Italian. And the truth of the matter was, he was half. Now, John Vesey and his brothers and sisters and mother would grow up in the area of 5th and Christian, 5th and Washington in Philadelphia. Now, uh, to this day, there are housing projects at that spot, and the city has attempted to rehabilitate that 5th and Wash area. However, it has been difficult. Now, John Vesey would talk about in books and interviews that, quote, they had nothing. And in fact, at most points in his life, his mother would support her family through welfare and other programs. She would even venture to begin selling drugs at one point, which would at one point do her in. And he would talk about she was a great mother. She would do whatever she could for her kids. And you know this would allow her uh, to really be a good mother. However, uh, as John would say, it wasn't easy, but she was a good mother and she did all she could. Now, John Vesey would be particularly close with his brother, uh, Billy Vesey. Billy was a known uh, individual around South Philly as well. And the Veseys were both very good with their hands, according to anyone that knew them throughout their adolescence and into their adulthood. John Vesey would talk that he would struggle in school. He never really cared much about the books. And he began hanging around with his uncle in his early teens that would introduce him not only to narcotics, but also the world of sex. And John Vesey would quickly get addicted to drugs. He would also discuss that by the age of 15 years old, he had two children and dropped out of high school after uh, he was kicked out for assault. He was never allowed to return and ended up dropping out. Now, as I said, John Vesey was very known around South Philly. And whether you agree with his decisions and his behavior or not, in his heyday, according to what I know, 
He was a pretty ferocious fighter, and he packed a vicious punch. Uh, they would work out in gyms, he and his brother, and uh, were pretty feared, frankly. Uh, around this time, there was some good news that came to the family, but it came through bad news. Uh, John Vesey would learn that his grandfather, uh, his mother's father, would actually die. Uh, and um, that would be a rough time for the family. The thing, though, that Sophia Vesey would now have would be steady work. He would leave her a business in the area of Ninth and Federal uh, in the Italian market. If you know anything about this area, it is a place stocked with bakeries, pizzerias, cheese spots, butcher shops, anything you want and need, the Italian market has you covered. And around this time at 9th and Federal, this was just north of Gino's and Pat Steaks. Uh, it is now a pizzeria, but at one point it was a bakery, and that is where uh, Dante Vizi had a uh, bakery. Now, Sophia Vizi would take it over, and they had a cre incredible biscotti, as far as I know, incredible baked goods. But there was something else that Sophia Vizi was doing out of her bakery. She was selling methamphetamine. And in 1983, she would actually get jammed up by the federal government. She would be involved with an individual named John Jumbo de Salvo. And according to a 1983 Citizens Crime Commission report, de Salvo was a very close associate of Raymond Long John Martirano. Now, for anyone that is not aware who Long John was, Long John uh, for decades was one of the largest methamphetamine dealers in Philadelphia. He was providing P2P, which is the main agent to make methamphetamine, to not only members of the Italian mafia, but associates as well, as well as individuals in black gangs, including the Junior Black Mafia, uh, the KNA group up in Northeast Philadelphia, and biker gangs. Raymond Long John Martirano was very uh, much an earner, and he was kicking up a lot of envelopes, not just Angelo Bruno, but to Nicky Scarfo as well. Sophia Vizi would be hemmed up in an indictment involving the methamphetamine, and this would be problematic for her. In fact, um, it would be really bad. Uh, she would ultimately hear some bad news as well uh, and would actually die in September of 1983 the very young age of 41 years old. So really by his 16th birthday, John Vesey had already seen a lot. He was addicted to drugs. He had two children. He had no real prospects. Uh, and his mother, his only caretaker, had died. Um, he didn't have a father. He didn't have a mother. Uh, and the mother that he had uh, was now gone. So for John Vesey, he would take to the streets to support his habit. By the age of 30 years old, he had been arrested almost 60 times. And really, he was doing typical addict behavior in Philadelphia. He was sticking people up. He was burglarizing homes. He was doing whatever he could to support his vicious narcotics habit. And many people, when they were approached by John Vesey, were very willing to give up what they had due to the reputation that he did have. By 1991, would finally catch up to John, John Vesey. He would head up to Frackville uh, for a two-year sentence if he was jammed up for robbery and assault charges. Now, this would come out in the trial that he would testify. And many years later, the prosecutor would ask John Vesey about his drug habit and what actually happened to that. He would claim that during his time at the State Correctional Institute at Frackville, he quit drugs cold turkey. And that from then on, he never touched a narcotic again. Now, whether we believe him or not, um, we have to take his word for it. Um, John Vesey, as far as I know, uh, after this, did not do narcotics. Now, you know, withdrawal can be a pain, but once you get past it, it can be fruitful. Now, uh, in those two years, it seemed like maybe he had fixed his life a little bit. Now, as we know, in the state prison system, once you get out on parole, you have to maintain gainful employment. And through some connections in South Philadelphia, he would begin working at a concrete company called C&C Concrete. Now, interestingly enough, C&C Concrete was owned by a family member of the new boss in town, John Stanford. Now, for anyone that doesn't know about John Stanford, John was actually very involved in legitimate uh, work as well as illegitimate work. But one of the things he was very close in and connected in was the construction industry. And there were all sorts of companies in South Philly that were popping up um, that John Vesey had his hands in. If you know anything about Nicky Scarfo before him, he also had his hands in concrete companies and things of that nature. 
John uh, Stanford would actually live in a beautiful home on Passion Avenue. It's very outfitted with brick, and it, it was very nice. Uh, from what I know, I would imagine CNC Concrete took care of that. Now, John would get a job there. He'd earn about $300 a week. And for him, I think he really just looked at it as, you know what, I have some gainful employment. Let me try to get back on my feet. I've got kids to take care of. Um, at that point, he would be approached by an individual called Frank Martinez. Now, Frank Martinez was from the area around 9th and Morris in South Philadelphia. And he would serve as a high up underboss in the family of John Stanford. Once Nikki Scarfo went away, John Stanford would anchor in the pipeline and become uh, the leader of what we know as the Philly mob. And Martinez would approach Stanfa and really kind of ask him, hey, do you want to make some work uh, on the side? Uh, we'll pay you some side work. Uh, why don't you come talk to some of my people and maybe we can get you in on some things. Now, the goal for Martinez was to find an individual to be an enforcer for the Stanfa crime family. Now, the Stanford crime family was not an incredibly uh, populated group. They did not have a ton of enforcers. And John Stanford knew he had to hit the streets. And from his connections, he knew John Vesey would be getting out and he'd be a tough guy. Maybe he might want to work for the family. Now, uh, he would, uh, John Vesey, be approached at a warehouse that Stanford owned. And Stanford would offer John Vesey $10,000 to take out this individual on the right Joey, skinny Joey Merlina. Now, at this point, there is a younger group of gangsters coming up, run uh, allegedly by this individual, Joe Merlina. There on the left uh, is Michael Changlini, a friend to Merlina. So he would be offered $10,000. And VC would say in an interview years later that, um, you know, you were offered $10,000 to kill someone that didn't seem like uh, crazy to you. And VC would respond, well, when you don't have any money, $10,000 is a lot of money, and you're willing to kind of do anything. Uh, on April 5th, 1993, he, alongside a cohort, Philip Coletti, would stalk Merlino to his club at 6th and Catherine Streets in South Philadelphia. The problem that VC would have that day is he couldn't necessarily take care of those two that day. The problem was his brother, Billy, was seen outside the club. Billy was a bon vivant in the neighborhood and knew pretty much everybody. Uh, and uh, he basically told Coletti, I can't shoot him now. My brother's outside. Uh, they would wait for Molino and Changalini to walk away. At that point, they would open fire on Changalini and Molino. Changalini would be killed at the scene. Merlino would luck out and walk away with a bullet in the buttocks. Now, for uh, Stampha, this wasn't good enough. He wanted Merlino dead, uh, and they would continue to stalk and try to kill people in that organization for a long time. And this is what would set off in the early 90s a vicious war in South Philadelphia between two sides, one of which was loyal to John Stampha, the other side, the bunch of young Turks loyal to Joey Merlino. Now, um, VC would kind of do what he had to do, but he began complaining because he felt like, look, I'm doing things for this family. I need to start getting paid. Stanford wasn't paying him. So VC was beginning to be a little bit more incensed. And you know, John VC would talk about several interesting situations. He became a bookmaker, started loaning money out, really started getting involved in a lot of mob um, uh, things. And he would talk about an interesting story quickly about an individual that he had a beef with called Joe Fudge. Uh, his real name is Joseph D. Simone. D. Simone was connected to the Stanford organization as well. And D. Simone was talking subversive about uh, John V.C. John V.C. would go to a cohort and basically say, bring him to me. Uh, an individual named Johnny Gongs Casa Santa would bring uh, Joe Fudge to John V.C. And V.C. would talk very glowingly about the fact that he would use a power drill on Joe Fudge's head. According to VC, he would discuss that he saw pieces of hair flying out of uh, D. Simone's head. And these are the kind of tactics that John VC was known to use to A, either get money out of someone or to uh, harass someone that had talked subversive about him. Weirdly enough, Joseph D. Simone would go to prison and would actually resurface several years ago. Uh, he was involved with a situation up in New York involving the Genovese crime family. Really quick, kind of a side story. 
Joe Simone claimed that he, D. Simone claimed that he left the life after he got out of prison, that he was surviving off Social Security and other government benefits. But one thing Joe D. Simone, Joe Fudge also said he did was he put parties connected to each other and made money off of that. He would make a connection with an individual named Michael Giamarino. Giamarino had been connected up to the Genovese crime family, and they owned uh, certain pizzerias, one of which Gennaro's Tomato Pie in South Philadelphia. Gia Marino wanted to get his tomato pies. He was associated with a pizzeria called Lombardi's, and he wanted to get that into Parks Casino. Now, Joe D. Simone had been affiliated with Parks Casino, and he made the connection. Ultimately, it would all fall apart because Parks Casino decided they, first of all, did not want to do business with the Genovese crime family, and they started to realize that Joe D. Simone, a.k.a. Joe Fudge, had more mob connections than maybe he let on. So back to VC. Uh, by September of 1993, uh, the Stanford Merlino War is a bit out of control. Now, John Vesey is still taking care of pieces of work for the family. He would be called upon to take care of another individual, this person, Frank Baldino. Now, Baldino was, uh, again, a neighborhood uh, known individual. A lot of people liked Frank Baldino, who was a bartender. He was moving around a little bit in the streets, but he was by no means a mobster. John Stanford wanted him dead, and he called upon his favorite hitman, John Vesey. And Vesey would talk years later that he actually liked Frank Baldino. It had no issue with him. Uh, but when he was told to kill someone, he went and did it. He would stalk uh, Baldino to the Melrose Diner at 15th and Pashyunk as uh, he saw Baldino walk to his car. Baldino got in with the windows down. Vesey rolled up, said hello, and shot him six times in the side of the head, and Baldino would die at the scene. The war would continue to ensue. And at this point, around this point, John Stanford decides that he is going to make John Vesey a member of the Philadelphia crime family. Now, a lot of people will say, why the hell was he made? He was not fully Italian. And you would be right. But that at that point, John Stanford was desperate for uh, underlings. He was willing to do what he had to do to make people – Maybe they didn't necessarily belong. I will say this about BC. He is half Italian, and he did very much grow up in a all-Italian neighborhood. So whether he bended the rules a little bit, for sure. Uh, John VC definitely wasn't some random person from you know Delaware County that had 10% Italian in him, though. He definitely was um, Italian. Now, one quick thing I wanted to talk about is the situation. This is how much of a psychopath John VC was and John Stanford was, for that matter. Uh, in the early 90s, Geraldo Rivera, who, as we know, a Fox News reporter now, he would approach VC and Stanford at a warehouse that Stanford owned. Stanford became so incensed that Geraldo Rivera wanted to interview him. Geraldo knocked on the door. Uh, Stanford would actually put a hit out on Geraldo Rivera. He would also put hits out on other media members, including Philadelphia writer George Anastasia, I believe he put a hit out on Kitty Caparella, who is a Daily News reporter as well. John Stanford was a lunatic. And as far as I know, there was still a contract out on Geraldo Rivera. Now, Rivera has went to higher end means, but this is the kind of guy Stanford was. And this started to get out of control because Stanford started ostracizing VC and other members of the family. Um, there was a situation where he wasn't treating his people correctly. And one of the people he wasn't treating well was John Vesey. You can't ostracize your people, make them do everything, and then not pay them or, or, or keep them whole. Um, in 1994, John Vesey saw the writing on the wall. It was really simple. He was either going to shut the fuck up, do what he was told, and eventually get indicted, uh, or he was going to have to realize that he was going to have to cooperate. There was no other way out. And he would go to see his brother Billy and a lawyer at the Melrose Diner in 1994. And Billy Vesey knew who these people were. He was very much tuned in to both sides. He was cool with both sides. He knew the problems with getting involved with certain people. And he would actually, through the lawyer, persuade John Vesey to cooperate. There was no other way out. Vesey would go to the federal building uh, and ask for a meeting with the sitting U.S. attorney. What the federal government would do is they would wire John Vesey up for sound. And this would set off, uh, as far as my estimation, one of the most successful wire prosecutions really ever in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, at one point, 
Stanford would be involved in an, an expressway shootout involving uh, certain mobsters. And he would go to uh, the hospital. His uh, son, Joey, was involved as well. And he would elicit VC to go see him in the hospital. And VC uh, was asked um, you know, to take care of some pieces of work, as usual, for John Stanfa. One of the pieces of work he wanted to take care of uh, was he wanted this individual, Biagio Adornetto, killed. Adornetto was a driver of Stanfa. He was a pizza maker. He was from Sicily, one of the zips that Stanfa knew. Adornetto was trying to date the daughter of Stanfa, Sarah. And he set off kind of a love triangle between himself and Miss Stanfa. John wanted him dead and on wire told Stanfa and Rosario Baloki to go kill Adornetto. And Adornetto, lucky enough, uh, the gun malfunctioned and he was able to get away. Adornetto is still alive and he actually, weirdly enough, would cooperate. It is now a barber in Boise, Idaho. It's a true story. That's him cutting hair there. The affiliate out of Boise would actually do a story on him several years ago, uh, but he would cooperate as well. This would really kind of decipher the end for Stanfa and VC. Uh, VC was cooperating. Stanfa was wired for sound. And the government felt like they had enough. There was concerns that VC was a rat. And what would happen, this would really be the end for VC, at least on the streets. In January of 1994, he would be called by Frank Martinez, the original individual that set him up with Stanfa. He wanted to have a meeting with VC. And he would ask uh, VC, if they could come pick him up, he alongside Vincent Al Pajamas Pagano would pick up uh, John VC and take him to an apartment at 7th and Sigel Streets in South Philly. Stanford would walk up to the top floor where the apartment was, and he saw that the room was outfitted with plastic. At that point, he knew the writing on the wall. He was going to be whacked. Somehow he would fight off Pagano and Martinez as he was shot multiple times. And if we see in this um, picture here, this is actually right around the time when VC was shot. He survived multiple bullets to the head and fought his attackers off. He would be found by the police at 6th and McKean Streets and taken off the street. Now, at one point, Billy VC would tell John, you got to get off the fucking street. Like, you need to go. You need to get out of here. They want you dead. They know what you're doing. Billy would also be told by John VC, look, you have to get off the street as well. Billy felt like he was okay and, quote, said, I ain't no pussy. Now, this would set up really a bad year for the VCs. In 1995, John VC would finally be called on to talk on behalf of himself on the Stanford family. And on October 5th, 1995, the week of his cooperation, um, he would get absolutely terrible news. That morning, his brother Billy would leave his home in the 2600 block of South Bouvier Street, just off Oregon Avenue in South Philadelphia. He would get into his GMC Jimmy, uh, according to his family, on the way to get some donuts at Dunkin' Donuts. He would pull down the small street, and at the corner of Oregon and Bouvier, gunmen would run up to his car and shoot him multiple times. His car would roll into a home south on Oregon Avenue. Discovered on him was a gun and $1,400 in cash. Now, the cash was not taken, and it was basically clear this was a mob hit. Now, for years around Philadelphia, no one has ever been brought to justice in the case on Billy Vesey. People have been brought to trial, but they were never convicted. Now, there are a few theories as to why Billy Vesey was killed. Many would believe that it had something to do with the fact that John Vesey was his brother. And that's obviously possible. There's also uh, a possibility that this was in uh, response to some of Vesey's behavior on the streets. There was also a growing theory that if you knew anything about Billy Vesey, Vesey was a big time bookmaker. Uh, according to what I know, one of the biggest in the area at the time. And it is possible that someone involved in that business may have killed him as well. But as I said, to this day, no one has ever been brought to trial in the case of Billy Vesey. Now, John would ultimately testify, though. He was not scared off if that was the goal. Vesey would, according to onlookers, be one of the most effective witnesses really ever. Uh, and in one um, back and forth between him and one of the uh, – defense attorneys, the defense attorney would ask John Vesey about the glasses that he was wearing. 
Um, and he said, did the government buy those glasses, John? And VC would respond, quote, yeah, uh, my vision's not been all right ever since your client shot me in the head. Um, so he would take these wisecracks on. He was a very descriptive witness. Do I agree with what John VC did? Look, I'm not going to, I don't have a personal relationship with any of these people. Um, I guess, you know, he had to do what he had to do. But when it comes to being on the stand, he was a pretty effective witness. Now, ultimately for John Stanford, this would mean the end. He would get life imprisonment for his crimes. He is still alive uh, and is in his 80s as he sits in federal prison. Frank Martinez would also get life in prison for his attempted hit on John B.C. and his other mafia crimes. Um, one also uh, individual, Vincent Al Pajamas Pagana, would also get a long prison sentence. He was hit with 80 years. And to this day, he is still alive in his 80s in federal prison. John B.C. would ultimately have to serve 10 years for his behavior on the streets, but he would be saved really from a life sentence by his cooperation. Now, I want to talk quickly about his behavior and whether we, what, whatever we say about John V.C. John V.C.'s behavior after the fact has been quite disturbing. Uh, during his sentence in 10 years in prison, he was um, disciplined by the Borough of Prisons over 100 times for interactions while in prison, including an assault on another inmate in 2004 with a broom handle. Uh, after his release, he is now in the witness protection program somewhere in America. And some disturbing cases have come up where he has called the family members of members allegedly of the Philadelphia mob and leave vicious voicemails. Uh, he would also be seen outside different businesses that Philly mob associates allegedly run. He has goaded certain people into believing that he is not absoluted from his crimes. And he definitely wants redemption for who he thinks killed his brother, VC. Is VC rehabilitated? I don't think he is. And I think it's been made clear that over the last decade or so, he sure as hell isn't. He can talk all the time as he wants about his seeing God and now believing in God and that he's married and he's left his Philly roots. But what would explain his recent trips to Philadelphia and his behavior after the fact? We'll ask the federal government, is that how a federal witness and a federal person in the program should be behaving? I guess we'll have to wonder. Sorry today for the long video, but I wanted to be descriptive and tell you the story of John VC. To put a bow in it, John VC is around and he's living somewhere in America. We'll have to see what happens. One thing I think we know about John VC, he doesn't let bygones be bygones. We'll have to wonder when he turns up next. As always, thank you for watching. I appreciate you being here. We'll see you next time. Make sure you hit this like and subscribe button so you never miss 